Today, I'm going to talk about something that doesn't get discussed enough. You know, mothers are considered so vital to the healthy upbringing of a child. Mothers are considered the ones who ferociously love and protect their babies, their children, young adults, and even their adult children. The question I want to tackle today is what do you do when a mother is not your protector? She's your perpetrator. Today, I want to talk about my journey to healing for another wounds. And I'm also going to talk about how that journey included sexual abuse by her boyfriend. Hey y'all, welcome back to my show. So today I'm going to be talking about um, a topic that could be triggering to you. And so I want to give a trigger warning at the outset of this. Um, if conversations about sexual abuse or physical abuse leave you uncomfortable or maybe dredge up painful memories for you. If at any point that you start to feel any discomfort or distress, um, please take care of yourself and, and step away. Okay. Um, I want to tackle this issue, this issue of mother wounds, because I believe it is so rarely discussed. We talk about father wounds all the time, um, but rarely do we talk about mother wounds. And I believe that's because we assume that, um, that mothers are going to just innately love and protect their children. But y'all, I'm a witness that that is not always the case. Now, in my first episode, I did share um, a high level about my childhood. And if you have not seen that, I would encourage you to watch that because that will provide some important context for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but what I want to do today is I want to talk about more of the nuance and the details of my experience and how it affected me as I grew into a woman. So one of the first questions that I want to tackle is what is my earliest memory with my mother? And I think this is important because one of the things that can happen when you've had um, a traumatic childhood is that you can kind of just repress memories to the point that you don't even remember chunks of your life. And that is the case for me. Um, my earliest memory, my earliest like crystal clear memory with my mom is when um, we moved from um, the Northern United States to Florida. And I do remember that there were men who came in and out of our condo. And I think at the time, I might have been like five, you know, but I, I do remember that there were just different men who came in and out. And, you know, she would casually introduce them to me, but it wasn't like they were memorable or there was anything um, that she was like, you just really have to know this person. But she would just casually introduce them to me as if they were just a friend. Um, but, you know, as I said in the first episode of the show, when I was about five and a half, she met a guy who became her living boyfriend. And that's when things got, got serious in that relationship. But I will tell you, I have a very vivid memory of my mom, even I think before she got into the relationship with her living boyfriend, I remember her taking me to this man's house. And I think he might've lived in Baltimore. I just, I remember it was cold. So it was somewhere up North. It could have been Baltimore, Philadelphia. I don't know. But she would take me to this this man's house and um, I would just kind of be left to my own devices. Like I had a room in the house and I would, you know, play with dolls in the room um, or watch television while she was with the man. And um, I didn't really know much about the man, but I just remember being in his house because you know, we had, it was, we had to like drive there. I mean, it was a long drive from Florida there. Um, but that was, I guess, a boyfriend of hers. I don't know. Um, uh, but I do remember that. And, um, when her, I guess, live-in boyfriend came to stay with us, uh, I don't remember going back to that man who was up North in Baltimore or Boston or Philadelphia. Or so. I just remember it was up North. Um, but as I said in the first episode, you know, when my mom introduced me to the guy who became my abuser, I remember I just, I didn't like him. Like I just, I could not get comfortable around him. 
And she told me that, you know, I needed to give him a chance, that he would grow on me, that he was a nice person. And so I just kind of believed my mom and, and tried to kind of relax. But it was hard because I just, I, I didn't like him and I just didn't feel comfortable around him. So when she had to go back up north for her sister's funeral and said that she was going to leave me with him, I did not want that at all. I did not want that at all. Um, when she left, I remember feeling very much so unprotected. And um, my feeling was accurate because the first night that she was away, he assaulted me. Uh, she was gone for a few days and um, it happened repeatedly. And because he told me that if I said anything that she would get rid of me, that instilled enough fear in me to make me be like, you know what, I, I'm not going to say anything. Like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep this to myself. And so when she came back, I tried to act normal as best I could, but I started to act out in school and, um, I became a problem child, got labeled as a problem child, et cetera. And, um, you know, my mom, I think she was of course frustrated with how I was acting and the fact that, you know, she would be told what was going on with me, that she needed to come to the principal's office and all that. So I think she was frustrated, uh, but she didn't know what was happening until I told her what was happening um, a couple of years later. And, you know, she had the guy arrested. I thought it was over, but she brought him back and the abuse resumed. Now, I would say that my original mother wound was created um, at a very specific moment. And I remember it before he came back when he was still locked up. We had a patio on the back of our house. It was like a bright blue patio. And um, one day while he was still locked up, my mom told me to come outside. She wanted to talk to me on the patio. So I came outside, you know, I closed the uh, sliding glass door behind me when I got outside to the patio and she had me sit down and she said, um, she said, Nona, you know, what, what would you think if so-and-so, her boyfriend's name, what would you think if he came back to live with us? And I remember being like, what? Uh, I don't want him to come back. I was stunned that the question was even being asked. And my mom got this look in her eye. It's like, like her eyes became dark. And she said, hmm, well, I'm the adult and this is my house. And I make the decisions. And he's coming back. And she got up, walked in the house, slammed the sliding glass door behind her. I remember that so vividly. She left me sitting outside by myself. And that like moment, like the physical, actual, like setup of the moment of me being left outside is the perfect metaphor for how I felt. I felt like I was discarded in favor of this man. And what was crazy about it is that he, he wasn't even employed. Like it wasn't like he was bringing something to the table. It wasn't like he was funding our life. You know, um, he lived with us. My mom was paying the bills. I think he might've had like a side job or something. I don't know, but, but she was the breadwinner. And she took me with her on the day of his release from jail. She took me with her to pick him up. And I remember when he got in the car and she gave him a hug. He kind of glanced over his shoulder at me in the back seat. And there was a smirk on his face. And I knew in that moment that um, I didn't matter. I knew in that moment that I didn't matter. And that created such a deep, deep wound within me. To add insult to the injury though, um, 
not only did he kind of pick up where he left off, he started abusing me again, not too long after he moved back in. Um, my mom became physically abusive. I remember a time very distinctively, I was nine, and uh, they had a tumultuous relationship, so they would you know, fight pretty often. And my mom and him were in the living room and they were arguing about something. I was in my bedroom. My mom called me into the living room to ask me a question. And I answered the question based on my understanding. Uh, but apparently she didn't like the answer. I don't know if it was the answer he gave or what. Um, my mom lunged at me and grabbed me around my neck and started strangling me. Um, I don't remember how she got off of me, but I do remember running into my room. I, I closed the door, I locked my bedroom door and I ran into my closet. I closed the closet doors and there was like a pile of dirty clothes in my closet that was sitting next to my hamper. My hamper had been overflowing. It was sitting next to my hamper. And I remember sitting on that pile of dirty clothes and pulling, pulling my legs into me and just wrapping myself tightly, like I was hugging myself. I remember just rocking myself and crying. I could hardly breathe because my, my throat was, was burning. I was crying and crying and crying. But I had to like stifle the tears because I didn't want her to come in the room and like start beating me again for crying. Uh, I remember that. I remember that because Later that day, I had tried to, I tried to take my life. Um, again, nine years old, I tried to end my life. I didn't know what was on the other side of death, but I figured whatever it was, it had to be better than what I was experiencing. And so um, that was painful. It was deeply painful. Uh, shortly after that, uh, my mom told me that she never wanted me. She told me that uh, my dad wanted me, but but she didn't want to have me, that she didn't want children. She told me that I I was a burden on her. And um, I felt, number one, I felt discarded when she left me out on the patio. Number two, I felt abandoned when she chose her boyfriend, my, her, my abuser, over me. Um, and then three, I, I internalized that and felt like I, I just wasn't good enough. Like she didn't even want to have me. So I had all of this kind of happening on the inside of me. Um, and it was inflicted by the person who should have been my protector, my defender, my advocate, who should have been the person healing the wounds that her boyfriend created. Um, but instead, she became um, a perpetrator. And so this is one of the reasons why I, I get really concerned when, whenever I share my story or anyone talks about the pain that their mother has caused them and people will be like, you only get one mom. You know, you only get one mom. You know, she, if it wasn't for her, you wouldn't even be here. You know, I've, I've had people even tell me when I would share um, just clips of, of my story and and things that I've had to learn from the situation. I've had people say, you need to just go shut up and stop talking about your mom. You know, um, you know, you need to honor her and this, that people who don't even know the story. Right. Um, but here's the thing. It is entirely possible for a mother to be physically present while emotionally absent. Um, it is entirely possible for a mother to birth you and make you feel like you are a mistake. It's entirely possible for that to happen because I've experienced it. Um, I think that being that I'm an only child, I did not have brothers or sisters to process anything with. Uh, I didn't even have family living in the area to reach out to. Everyone else was like, you know, multiple states away up north. So I didn't have anybody to reach out to. I wasn't raised around family. I didn't even know anything about family, really. Um, I had like maybe one cousin who I would see periodically, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like we were constantly together. And so in many ways I was, I was just by myself. And so 
I think the way that I kind of processed what was happening to me is I internalized it. You know, I thought that I was the problem. Like I thought that um, something was wrong with me. You know, I needed to be, I needed to be a better daughter. You know, something had to be wrong with me, right? Like why, why would my mom treat me this way? Why would she allow this to happen to me? Something must be wrong with me. And I think, I think that is what happens when we experience rejection from our mothers. Of course it happens when we experience rejection from our fathers, but I think there is something um, just even deeper when it's our mother who rejects us, right? Because at the end of the day, like mom is supposed to be the one that you can count on no matter what, you know, like dad, you know, let's say you get locked up. Dad may never visit you. Mom's going to come and bring you some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or something. Like mom's going to make sure you're okay. And so we have this, this belief that, man, if my mom, the one who carried me, the one who truly is responsible for my existence, you know, father made his, his contribution, he made his deposit, but my mom, like her body was my incubator. She carried me. Um, if she thinks that I'm not good enough, it must be true. And so I, I internalized what was happening to me. I thought it was my fault. I thought what her boyfriend did to me was my fault. Um, even from a young age, I would think like, man, what did I do to make him think I wanted it? You know, um, when my mom would attack me, I had all types of, there was all types of physical and verbal stuff. I would process it as, man, what did I do wrong? And I think a lot of times, um, a lot of times that's what happens with mother wounds is we just, we internalize it. We think that, that, uh, that we're the problem. So, um, I mentioned in my first episode, I want to talk about it because I think it's important that, you know, I, I tried to end my life at the age of nine. I tried again at the age of 11. Um, I actually have a, a scar. You probably can't see it, but I have a scar on the inside of my left wrist. Um, from when I tried to try to slip my wrist, um, I just missed the artery, just missed it. And so I look at this as, as just a tangible example of the grace of God, the protection of God. But after that second attempt, um, a classmate of mine in the sixth grade invited me to go to church. And, um, that's where I found Jesus. I found Jesus. I found hope. I found purpose. I found a community and, um, my mom didn't like it. My mom didn't like the fact that I, I was happy. She was worried that I was telling people about her. Like she even voiced many times that uh, she thought I was, you know, saying something bad about her not coming to church. Um, she really took my faith as an affront on her motherhood for some reason. And so when I started going to church, um, the youth pastor would come pick me up. My mom did not come with me. And eventually she, uh, kicked me out of the house. And I remember the thing you have to understand, I mean, looking back on it now that I have language for it and I've, I've done, uh, some study on mental health disorders. My mom, um, my mom has some bipolar disorders. Like I, I see now that there, there definitely was kind of like that manic depressive, kind of polarization. There were times when she was extremely happy, super energetic. Then there were other times where she was just super angry and depressed. And, um, I never quite knew what I was walking in on at any given moment, but you know, she kicked me out of the house. I went to go stay with a family that went to our church and she made me leave the church shortly after that. She came to get me from school one day. She was angry that I was staying with them. She was convinced that I had told them lies about her. And, um, yeah, she made me leave the church. And so I was home. I was home for a bunch of years and I just had this seething resentment inside of me, just anger, anger that she had the power to take everything away from me. You know, she had the power to, to let her boyfriend abuse me knowingly. She had the power to herself abuse me, call me every name in the book. Mind you, while all this is happening, I'm at school. Um, 
after, you know, accepting Jesus as Lord of my life, really turned my behavior around. So I was making great grades. Um, I was starting to get involved with student organizations. Um, I was becoming a star student at the exact same time that my mom is, is literally ripping me to shreds at home. And so, um, it was hard. Like it was hard. Like I, I know now that that season of my life really created this like perfectionist streak in me because I had to anticipate what would set her off. I had to anticipate, um, what would make her angry. And so I would go above and beyond to try to do everything I could to make her happy. And, um, that it just, it just didn't work. Like some days she would be happy other days, no matter how hard I tried, it just didn't work. Um, she took a lot of pleasure in my grades though. I remember times when she would get on the phone and call her friends and tell them, you know, about the A's that I got. And, um, the way that she framed it though, was, you know, it was because of her, because of her being such a great mom. And, um, you know, I was smart because of her and, I remember listening to those conversations in bewilderment, you know, she didn't even know what my classwork was, never checked my homework, never asked me questions, but when my report card came in and it was looking good, she was ready to take the credit for it. Um, and I share this because again, it just built resentment in me. It built so much resentment in me that I made a decision. I think in middle school, I made a decision that when I went to college, I would never return home, that I would never return home. Um, and so fast forward to uh, my high school graduation. I was selected as the commencement speaker. I was selected to give the commencement address. And the morning of my graduation, the morning of my graduation, my mom came to me and told me she wasn't coming to the graduation. I don't remember what happened. I don't remember what set her off. Um, but I do remember I was so numb by that point. I didn't even care. I was just like, all right. And I left. Um, I should say that same year, um, that exact same year, my senior year in um, high school, I felt called by God to go into ministry. I told my pastor, I had joined a new church by then because I was driving by then. I had a job and I was driving at that point. I told my pastor that I felt called to preach. And so at the age of 17, um, he started to pour into me, invest into me, and I ended up uh, doing a trial sermon. Now, I don't know if churches still do this, probably not, but a trial sermon, basically, he gave me time on a Sunday to preach um, in order to kind of test my gifting. And when I told my mom what I was doing, she decided she was going to come. And this was her first time ever coming with me to church, all right? Um, she brought her boyfriend which she was what it was, but she brought a boyfriend. And, you know, as I was kind of giving the preliminary remarks of my sermon, I mentioned, as is customary, I just thanked the pastor, his wife, um, for their belief in me, for mentoring me. Um, I honored them and the other leaders in their respective places. I also recognized my mom and said I was really glad that she was with me that day. And y'all, after we left the church, you know, the, the message went really well. Everyone was so complimentary. After we left the church, we were driving home. My mom cussed me out, cleaned out, told me how offended she was that I honored the pastor more than her, um, called me every name in the book, every name in the book. <laughs> And I remember sitting in the back seat, looking out the window while all this was happening. And I was thinking to myself, you know, you didn't come have to bail me out of jail. You didn't come to the hospital because I just gave birth to a baby. You didn't have to come pick me up from a friend's house because I had been drunk or OD'd on drugs. Like you just came to see me preach at a church a church that you've never even been to. You just came to hear me talk about how much I love Jesus. And, and your response 
is to be angry because you feel that I honored the pastor more than you. I said in that moment, I was like, yep, I'm definitely never coming back home. I didn't even say anything. So I give you that context because fast forward to the day that I was graduating from high school and she said she wasn't coming to the graduation. I was just like, okay. Um, I already had my academic scholarship to University of Florida already nailed down and locked up. I'd already been accepted to the school. And so I was like, all right, well, bye. She apparently did come. Um, she told me later she came and, uh, you know, it was fine. But I think by then I was so numb to just the mental and emotional abuse, the psychological tactics. I was numb to it, um, by then. And so, yeah, I went to college and ended up meeting my husband there. I shared that in the first episode. Um, you know, when I, when I met my husband, as I think anybody would, he was really, really keen on getting, uh, building a relationship with my mom, you know? And the thing is my mom, she's, she's a very nice person to, to initially meet, you know, she's funny, uh, personable. So when he met her, he just could not understand why we didn't have a relationship. He was like, she seems great. <laughs> um, but I told him, I was like, look, we have a very complicated relationship. There's a lot of hurt there. And I just said, um, uh, my mom just isn't safe. And he just, because his family is a pretty traditional family, close, tight knit, mother, father, brothers, sisters, he just couldn't understand how it would be possible that a child would not be close with their mom. Like he just couldn't understand. So even when I tried to explain, you know, what happened to me in childhood, uh, when I tried to explain what her boyfriend did to me, what she allowed to happen, knowing what he was doing to me, you know, he was just kind of like, well, you know, maybe, maybe she just is guilty. She feels guilty. And maybe that's why she just can't seem to, to get it right. But he kept encouraging me to try to have a relationship with her. And so, um, after we got married, after we got married, um, my mom and I, first of all, um, when, when my husband came into my life, initially we were not speaking, but when he came into my life and he wanted to build a relationship with her, we started to talk because of that. And, um, after we got married, my husband was just like, I really want you to have a relationship with your mom. And I kept saying it is not that easy, but you know, I wanted to try again for like the hundredth time. So one day, um, I decided that I was going to have my mom come to town and spend the weekend with us in our new home and uh, just do like a mother-daughter weekend, you know, manny's, petties, go out to my favorite restaurants, maybe do some shopping. So I went uh, to pick her up. You know, she lives a couple hours away, still to this day. Went to pick her up and uh, everything was initially going good. Like she had a really positive disposition to meet her. When she got in the car, she was smiling. And as we were driving to my town, I said, you know, mom, don't you think it's weird that we don't really have a relationship? And she was like, what do you mean? I said, you know, like a typical mother daughter relationship, like hang out, talk on the phone, enjoy each other, take trips. Like, you don't think that's weird. And she was like, not really. <laughs> And I was like, well, you know, I, I would actually really like that. Like, I would really like us to have a relationship. And she said, um, well, I mean, I think things are, are fine the way they are. And I said, well, in order to have the type of relationship that I imagine for us, we have to talk about what happened when I was a child with your boyfriend. And I felt the car turn icy, like the mood in the car turn icy. Um, I knew that it wasn't going to go well after the way that the mood shifted. And, and you should know that because of my childhood, and this may be your situation too, if you've dealt with abuse, um, especially what I now know is narcissistic abuse, um, you can become incredibly sensitive and attuned to people's moods. And so I felt the shift in the car very, very clearly. Um, but my mom, she, she basically said to me, there's nothing to talk about. 
And I was like, yes, there is. Like you've you've never apologized for what happened. Like you've never taken ownership of what happened. And she said, well, the reality is, you know, he was there because because you wanted all those toys and, and you know, you, you had all these things that you wanted and he was helping me buy them. Now, here's the thing, y'all. I said it earlier, but he didn't have a job. Like he was unemployed for probably 90% of their relationship, you know? But she basically was like, you know, it's because of you, because you wanted him to buy you things. And then this is what she said. This, she said something that put the final nail in the coffin. She said, besides... It would have never happened if you would have just kept your legs closed. And I said, huh. So in other words, it was my fault. Five years old, six years old, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. It was my fault. It's my fault. Um, I turned my car around. I took her back home. And then I drove back to my house, walked in the door without her. And my husband was like, what happened? I couldn't even speak. I was so deeply hurt. I didn't even speak about it. And what's funny is, you know, by then I knew the, the verses of scripture, like, you know, you're fearfully, wonderfully made royal priesthood, chosen generation, blah, blah, blah. I knew all those scriptures that affirmed my worth and my value in the eyes of God, but having my mom be so callous and so dismissive of me, it did something to me, which is why having these mother wounds are just a different breed of wound. They just are. Um, and then my husband and I, we waited about five years to try to get pregnant. Um, got pregnant with my first son, um, but he was born at 26 weeks. Very, very premature. He was two pounds, nine ounces. And um, he had, had to immediately um, get, um, get sent to a level three neonatal intensive care unit. That's like the highest level possible because his life was so fragile, so tenuous. Well, my mom knew I had been pregnant. We had not been talking because again, after that thing happened, I was just like, you are not safe. I can't do this. We hadn't been talking for years, but she knew I was pregnant because she would keep in touch with me. I should also mention while we were not talking, what my mom would do is she would tell people how horrible of a child I was. And she would just have these people call me. Like she would give strangers my number neighbors my number and have them call me and they would be so angry how could you not talk to your mom how could you do that you know you only get one mom and I was like you don't even know what's going on but they would be just adamant that I was wrong but then fast forward a few months they would always call me back and be like no something's wrong with your mom I'm sorry that I even came at you like that but I say that because I, she she knew what was going on with me she knew I was pregnant she called the day my son was born just tragic, traumatic day. I, I was literally just anxious. My anxiety was, was on 10. She calls me and she tells me, you know, well, you know, I guess since you didn't tell me that my grandson was born, you know, I guess I had to learn about it through the grapevine. And so I called her back and I was just like, hey, if you want to come to town and see him, you're more than welcome to. He is your grandson. Because like, it was never my intent. Like, I'm not a vindictive person. So it was never my intent to, like, not be in her life, have her not be in my life. I just knew she wasn't safe because of choices that she made, you know? So anyway, she comes She comes to my town, and uh, my son fighting for his life in an incubator, two pounds, nine ounces, a little tiny thing. She comes to town. I had set a room up for her because I was th she, she wasn't working, so I was thinking she was going to stay for a while, right? Well, my mother had given me um, a picture. It was like a, it was like a canvas of a vase or something. And I, I told her I didn't want it. This was like years before. Told her I didn't want it. It did not go with anything I had in my house, but she insisted that I take it. Uh, my husband's mother saw it and she wanted it. So I gave it to her. Uh, my mom, she comes to town, goes, sees my, my baby boy, 
her first only grandchild, sees him in the incubator, comes to my house, asks uh, me, mind you, I'm literally just getting out of the hospital, stitched up, in pain, anxiety on 10 for my baby. She said, hey, where's that picture I gave you? And I said, oh, um, Tim's mom wanted it, so I gave it to her. This woman got mad, packed her things, and left. Left me, left her grandson, because I gave a picture that she gave to me to my husband's mom. <laughs> Um, but that is, is just an example. It typifies what I had to navigate as a child and what I've had to navigate as an adult, which is this sense of being controlled. You know, if, if I don't do what she wants the way that she wants it, um, she will go years without speaking to me and be totally fine with it and tell people that I'm the problem. And I'm sharing all of this with you because... If you have had to navigate something like this, I need you to know you are not crazy. You are not crazy. Even if people um, in your family keep saying that you're the wrong one, they keep saying that uh, you need to make it right, I need you to hear me. It's not your responsibility. So um, my extended family, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins, most of them have taken her side without even knowing the details. Most of them have decided that I am just this ungrateful child. And, uh, you know, she was just this great mom. And here I am just this ungrateful child because she does a really, really good job of, um, kind of painting herself as the victim. You know, she did so much for me and I just, I just don't, you know, I just don't want to be a part of her life because I've just, I've just become so, I don't know, famous that, you know, I just have neglected her. Never mind the fact that she discarded me and abandoned me and allowed her boyfriend to abuse me and um, threatened to not support me in all types of different ways. The fact that I just got older and made a decision to protect myself since she has abdicated that responsibility. Um, she has decided that that makes me wrong. And so I share this story with you because I, I want to give you just a couple quick insights as I wrap this up. Um, mother wounds are hard, but there is something that God gave me revelation about that really started me on my journey to healing. And that is this. People will tell you all the time that you need to forgive, right? Like you need to forgive what the person did. And that is absolutely true. Forgiveness is not an option. It is a requirement so that we can, um, we can honor God, right? Jesus was, he said, you know, we, we don't just forgive seven times. We forgive 70 times seven. So forgiveness is a commandment. And forgiveness is only one side of the coin of a healthy relationship. This is the revelation God gave me. Yes, we have to forgive a person who offends us because that frees our future from the pain of our past. And the other side of the coin that is required for a healthy relationship is repentance. Jesus did not say, forgive for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see, you can forgive in a prideful spirit. Like you can get to the place that you see yourself as a martyr. Like I'm just, I'm so forgiving and people just hurt me, but, but I forgive them. You can get to a place that you see yourself as better than other people because you're the one who's always forgiving. But repentance requires humility. There is no way to repent in pride. Repentance requires humility. It requires you actually seeing your wrong, seeing your fault, and seeing the need to change because of it. What started me on my journey to healing from my mother wound was releasing myself from the guilt that people were trying to put on me. This idea that I need to forgive her and forgive her and forgive her. You know, she's, you only get one mom. You got to forgive. You got to forgive. 
Yes, I have to forgive and she has to repent. Because I can forgive you from a distance, but that doesn't mean our relationship is healthy or reconciled. Relational reconciliation requires both sides of the coin. And this is why I hope that if you are navigating these types of wounds, that you will stop feeling like you have to do all the work because there is work on both sides where there is an offense that has occurred. Yes, I need to forgive you because that frees me from the pain of it. And you need to repent for it because you need to see the wrong of your actions and your decisions. And what repentance does is repentance doesn't just apologize. Repentance actually changes direction. I will never do that again. An unrepentant person is actually dangerous because if they're unrepentant, they're just going to keep doing it over and over and over again. Um, so how is my relationship with my mother today? Um, you know, when she needs me, when she needs my family, we make sure she's taken care of. We are not in fellowship, so to speak. Like we don't talk, um, regularly. I would love that. I would love to get to a place where my mom saw the, the need of a relationship with me, but she doesn't. And I'm, I'm finally free enough to know that that's not my fault. It's not my fault. Um, I'm free enough to know that the choices that she, she's made are not because I was a bad child. Um, they're not because I did something wrong. Um, and so I'm okay with that. So I have learned to love from a distance because you cannot love someone up close who is not safe. So what do I want um, you to know if you're going through the same thing? Um, the first thing I want you to know is that you're not wrong and you're not crazy. You know, you're not wrong and you're not crazy. And I do think that sometimes we have to give ourselves, we have to give ourselves the liberty that God has already given us. Some of us are in bondage to relationships that God freed us from a long time ago, but we're in bondage to them because of guilt. And so you're not wrong, uh, you're not crazy. After you've done everything that you can do and they refuse to change, you need to release them. And I know that's hard. I know it sounds easy and it's hard in practice, but I promise you, once you get it in your mind, that they're not going to change. Um, you realize that you're not responsible for their decisions anymore. And that's, that's kind of the, the evolution I had to go through is I had to realize I'm not responsible for the decisions that she makes. Um, I'm just responsible for how I show up. So that's what I hope you get out of this episode today. Mother wounds are real. Um, they are painful, but healing is possible through Jesus, all right? You are not crazy. God loves you. And so do I. I'll see you next time. <laughs>